Woodworking machinery can cause serious injury. Always read and understand the user manuals for all equipment used. Remember, dust, fumes, liquid, sharp or heavy moving objects can be deadly. Always wear appropriate personal protective equipment or PPE. Any omission of PPE during this presentation is to aid communication and is not an endorsement of the practice. The Nova Woodturners Guild, or NWG, its authors, presenters, and producers assume no responsibility or liability for accidents or damages resulting from the information conveyed within this presentation. Only you can keep yourself safe. Please do. If you're unsure, don't do it. Welcome to my shop. My name is Gordon Marshall. I'm a member of the Nova Woodturners Guild in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And today I want to talk a little bit on ways for woodturners to color their wood after they have it turned. What we're going to look at is I have some maple samples and I'm going to use some different products coloring the maple samples. I chose maple simply because it's one of the most common woods that turners have available. We're going to be using three different products to do the coloring. One is an aniline wood dye that I got from Lee Valley. The second one is a dye from called Color FX, which is from Wood Essence out of Saskatoon. The third item is very commonly found. It is artist oil paints. So if a person wanted to do a color and didn't have some stain or dyes, they could go to the store and buy a tube of artist oils. The other thing that we need to think about when we color wood is preparing your wood. People will normally, they'll turn their item, they'll go through a certain number of grits depending upon the individual. It will feel smooth and they'll say, we're ready to go. I'm now going to apply some finish. If you're using a dye type product, you will find that any scratches that you missed in the sanding process will stand out quite noticeably in your finished product. So sanding isn't very important. I have here a board that I've prepared. It went through the planer then I took a random orbital sander, sanded down to 240 grit on this end, to 400 grit on the other end. A lot of the members of my guild like to sand up to fairly high grits because they like the smoothness of the product that they're getting because they're putting clear finishes on. Today, I'm going to use one of the aniline dyes from Lee Valley. It happens to be a green one. And we're going to test to see, is there a difference between absorption of the stain into a 240 grit or a 400 grit piece of wood? Also, we'll see, did I make any errors in my sanding? Is everything sanded smooth? So, for simplicity's sake, I poured some stain in. The stain that I've mixed is based on the Lee Valley's envelope as far as amounts of product to water. It's a water soluble product. So I'm just going to take my brush first. I'm going to add it to the 240 grit section. And you can see the absorption goes through the stain, or the, the, the absorption of the stain into the wood will vary slightly depending upon the grain of the wood. And of course if this was a quarter sawn piece of wood or flat sawn you may find a difference in the absorption. So now I'm adding some to the 40 to 400 grit section and as soon as I get this done I'm going to take a cloth using just a piece of paper towel and you can see it's already mostly absorbed. A little more come off of this one. The reason being is 
this surface is slightly more burnished because it's 400 grit versus 240. One thing that you'll notice, there's some lighter spots because of grain, and here there's some bird's eye in the piece, and you'll see that the stain has gone into the bird's eyes as well. So you end up with a little difference, but not a lot. But you will notice that on the 400 grit section, it's not quite as dark. So if a person wanted a darker stain, you may have to add another coat. Now, for demonstration purposes, I have not let this fully dried. You really don't have to let it dry between coats. But you can see again, a lot of the stain is coming back off. The reason it's coming back is simply because the wood has been burnished to a higher degree, meaning it's a little harder, does not absorb the water and the stain. So you can take from this, if you're looking for a darker color of the wood, it's best to sand it to a lesser degree than maybe you're normally used to. If you want to have a toning to the wood or a or lighter color of stain, maybe you want to go a little better, a little higher grade in your sandpaper. But remember, if if you compare this to some of the smaller spindle items, for a pen as an example, if you were to finish a big piece of wood like this up to two or three thousand grit, the stain is probably not going to penetrate really at all. So this is what happens just simply on boards that have been sanded. The next demo, I want to talk about the different types that we're using. I have a board, again, through the planer, and this one is done to 240 grit. So the same as the bottom section here. I've simply marked off the top section. I'm going to stain with water-based, which is the dye from Lee Valley. The second one, I'm going to introduce another product, and it's a dye that is alcohol-based. The dye that I'm using is the Color FX from Wood Essence out of Saskatoon. There's a variety of these products available. This one is a concentrated dye that is soluble in water or alcohol. The aniline dye from Lee Valley is only a water-based product. There should be a little difference between the absorption on the two. Some people would look at a water-based product and say, I don't know if I want to use that on my turned item. It's going to impart water into the wood, and yes, it will. Could it raise the grain? Possibly. So if you wanted to, if, this, if the grain raised a little bit in these water samples when you used it on your turning, you may have to take a soft pad and just cut it back slightly. Remember though, if you cut it back much, you're going to affect the penetration of the stain and it may, you have, may have light areas and dark areas. So I wouldn't worry about sanding just a slight with a 600 uh, soft pad, something like that. So here, I'm going to use a couple other samples. I have a red from Lee Valley. And you can see it's a quite a dark product. Again, totally done to the the uh, directions on the packet. Aniline dyes are, have been known for being a very intense color and if you happen to get it on your hand when you're mixing, um, be prepared. You're going to be red for a long time. So in this case, I'm going to start. You can see that there's a little more grain in this piece, particular piece of maple. So I'm going to put on 
blue on one side and you can see it's a beautifully rich blue. I actually made a vase back a couple years ago using this color. I've had quite a few comments over the years about things that I have colored and the beauty of the aniline dyes is that you can get a very very strong color. Something else that you will notice red and blue. If you think about a color wheel if you have red and put blue on it what does it give you? Purple. So if I take some of the red and come over the blue, you will see, see well, most of that color is done already. There's where you can start to vary the colors that, you're, that you get mixing the products. You can mix them ahead of time to get a purple, but you can also do it just on the piece of wood. So now I'm going to have a look at using products with alcohol. This is simply denatured alcohol. Uh, it's funny, it's under different names in different countries. Um, when I went looking for it, I found it under ethanol as a camp fuel for camp stoves. I had a hard job to find it any results. And for those who live in Canada, it was Canadian Tire who was the person was the company who had it. So I'm putting a mix here of the denatured alcohol. And what I want to do is I'm going to add the drops and what I'm trying is to match up the alcohol dyed consistency it's about the same as the Lee Valley. You'll find that with these concentrated products you will end up putting in more than they suggest in order to match it to Lee Valley. Uh, the suggestion for this is one drop per ounce. It takes a lot more than one drop per ounce to match the aniline dyes mixed at the proper ratio. So you will have to play around. Now I'm putting a lot more than drops in simply because I want the colors to come close. It dissolves quite readily. Here's these. So alcohol. Of course, alcohol being a little thinner. It has a tendency to run a little bit more. And we should see a different absorption rate as well. You can see the two reds are not identical colors, but that's simply because we're doing colors from two different companies. And again, if we overlap our colors a little bit, you start to see some changes. Now I have not, I didn't wipe this off really at all, 
I don't know if it shows on camera, but the alcohol is virtually absorbed in the red side already. Just very little bit. Even though it was very liquid when I was putting it on, it absorbs in quite closely. But you can notice they do not color to the depth that the aniline dye does. You can see a little bit of the grain, even though the concentrations in the cup look very similar. The alcohol does not penetrate exactly the same way. Now, hopefully I've got picked up the right brush here. We'll see. Yeah. So if I put another coat on, and remember the alcohol is not going to raise the grain in the wood to any degree where the water may. And you can see it's it's seeking in a little bit. If I let it last, stay a little bit longer, it would have sunk in more. But notice the distinct difference in how they go into the wood. If you're looking for an intense color, my feeling is an aniline dye will give you the boldest uh, color for the dollar. Alcohol, for some people, they may find it a lot more useful friendly because it does evaporate quickly and it doesn't impart any really any moisture into the wood at all. So you can see there's they're coloring in a different respect. This one is more of a semi-transparent color. This is more an opaque color. The last sample that I want to use is a simple one that anybody can do as long as they have a oil base product to add it to. This happens to be Watco Danish oil, clear. So it does separate a little bit. I just put it in a small bottle. This happens to be uh, this sample packet I purchased at Michael's, and I believe it was on sale. I believe it was $9.99 for the packet, and there's one, two, three, four, 16 colors. So here, I'm simply going to add color. So it's the same painting oil for any, any of our viewers who are artists and are using paints. The oil, we only want to put in enough oil to give you a little bit of a slurry. We're not looking to make, we don't want it to be liquid. We simply want it to be basically a a slurry. If you get it too runny, you'll find that it doesn't uh, cover very well at all. So, that small amount. So now, come down here, and I'm just going to use one, one of the oils. So if a person wanted a red or a blue or a green item turned item, go buy one tube of artist oils. The reason I chose oil is because I, I particularly use oil finishes on virtually everything I do. Um, I'm not a person who does uh, water-based polyurethanes and these types of things. Uh, is not something that I normally do very often. And the beauty about it is, if I finish a lot of my products with Watco Danish oil, so it enables me to, I don't have to worry about any incompatibility issues. I have found over time, if you use a piece of paper towel or a cloth, it will start to take the stain and it will absorb the, the color will absorb into the cloth. Wax paper, piece of plastic bag would work just as well. 
And by doing that, you remember the grain in the artist oil, the pigment, the grain size, would be bigger than what would have been in the aniline dye. So it needs to be pressed or rubbed some to get it into the wood. So a different red, but now I'm rubbing that to the same degree that I rubbed with the with the uh, wax paper. And you can see very easily you get a beautiful color. Where it's mixed with a little bit of the oil finish, I know that once that has dried, I can go over it with my Danish oil or whatever oil product I was using and it would be 100% compatible. If a person wanted to use a water-based product, then simply your mixture would be a water-based finish, for example, uh, a water-based polyurethane, and an acrylic tube of paint. So this is, gives you an idea of how you can stain a simple piece of maple quite quickly it has not changed, this one in particular, the wood is, feels just as smooth as it did when I started. A slight amount of texture and a slight amount of texture. But of course, the oil finish has not dried yet. So there's a couple samples using Just a sanded board. If you were a furniture maker uh, or making small uh, furniture items or just small uh, items that you wanted to uh, hand out for Christmas presents, that type of thing, you can see that very quickly you can have quite brilliant colors. We are a wood turner though, so why don't we try it on something that's actually been turned? Now, this particular bowl. Um, I don't have no idea when it was turned. It's been sitting up on a shelf for, I'm going to say, probably four or five years. I don't even remember where it came from. Um, naturally, it would have been a piece of maple. But what I have is I have one-third of it natural. So it's just been sanded to 240, nothing else. The next section... I have covered the wood with a Minwax water-based sanding sealer and sanded, let it dry and sanded it back. So you can see there's a slight difference in color. The last section is a section that I have a coat of Watco's Danish oil. So for example, if, I, if you had turned an item and you started to put a coat of oil on it and thought, oh darn, I wanted to color that. Can I still color it? Well, let's find out. So what I'm going to try is, since I have the uh, oil one right here, I'm going to go back. We're going to do a little bit in each section. So this is natural section. Sanding sealer section. Because in theory, the sanding sealer, that section, because we have sealed the wood, the stain should not absorb to the same degree. And with the Danish oil section, is it going to go in at all? We've already had a coat of oil put on it. So that's the oil. We're going to go, this is some alcohol, and you can see I picked up the wrong brush, because the blue and the red has made a different color, and that's perfectly fine. Maybe I wanted to mix them, we don't know.
and now I'm going to show you what happens if I use a piece of kitchen towel with the water-based stain. See what happens? It absorbs it, it absorbs so much liquid that sometimes you don't know how it's going to turn out. So oil, alcohol, water. And this is on unfinished wood. So again, or sorry, this is Watco. With the Watco section, it's already been coated with an oil finish. The oil didn't seem to have any problem at all. The water didn't penetrate anywhere near as much as it did on the unfinished wood. And the alcohol absorbed, but alcohol absorbs at different rate. It penetrates more and it absorbs, takes the, the color with it. So you can see there's actually some difference in the grain and the wood. It really shows up with the alcohol base. Now if we go back to the natural section, which I put some oil on. Oh, I guess I made a, I turned it around, didn't I? So this will be water. I find the brush is a lot better at putting on water. You can see how dark it is? Back to our alcohol. Now you can see this was the Watco natural finish, or unfinished, I should say, natural. Absorbed in, water based absorbed in quite deeply, same as it did on the board. The oil base absorbed in quite deeply as well. And once I smooth it around, you see it starts to change color a little bit because on the turned item, the grain going down around the edge has been burnished a little differently than it would here. The alcohol penetrated better than it did on the oil-based finish, but it still shows the grain differences more. So on all of these you can see on the Watco so far, oil-based was the strongest color because we're putting oil over oil. Unfinished we're putting, with unfinished, water bay, water sunk in, was absorbed much more readily. The oil didn't get absorbed quite as much. The alcohol absorbed in, but it absorbed into the softer areas quicker than it did the harder areas. Now this is the sanding sealer, which is the one I started, and didn't process in the same manner. So here's water-based stain over sanding sealer. And alcohol over sanding sealer. Now I'm just going to let that little bit of alcohol absorb in to see how See what happens. One thing I, I want you to notice between the two. On all of these, there was a difference between the three. The Watco coated ones was definitely a difference in absorption because there's an oil base coat been put on. Natural wood the products absorb differently. But if you notice, alcohol absorbed much smoother. It had a much more even finish. 
than it did on either one of the other ones. Oil base didn't absorb quite as well. If you compare them, you know, the oil on the oil was the darkest for the oil bit, for the oil. Oil on the natural didn't absorb as well. Water base is strong on natural. Water base is strong on minwax, or relatively so. On the oil, water doesn't absorb, and you would expect oil and water don't mix. So the finish that you want, the finish you have in the wood, the grain in the wood may be highlighted by some more than others. So it's best to play around with whatever stain or coloring that you have and see how does it get affected. The one that is the interesting one is here. A simple coat of sanding sealer moderates colors. And on most of the turned items that I do, if they're going to be colored, they have a sanding sealer put on them. Because I don't want to have a scenario where this happens, that I may be putting a couple different colors on, and I don't want one to absorb in too, too much and be too dark. Because once it's absorbed into this natural wood, there's no way you're ever going to change it other than trying to cover it up. And that's very hard, covering up a dark stain. So it gives you an idea of what to expect depending upon what you've done with your wood. If you have an item that you turned, you put an oil finish on it, it hadn't been waxed, it just had an oil finish on it, and you realize it just doesn't look as good as I had hoped. What can I do? Go buy a tube of Artis oil paint, mix up a slurry, and you'll find that you'll be able to color it to a color and then present that as a gift instead of it being natural. It can still be natural on the inside, but you're going to have a color on the outside. So that's number two. Number three, this is just simply a turned item that's been started. And I want to have an what can we do with this? It's got different grains. We've got a crack. If we just ignore the crack, for, you'll notice that there is different colors in the voids. There's a lot of different grain. There's a lot of different color. What could we do to this? We could take it, and I'm just going to use a towel for, for this one. We could simply take it and put a stain on it. And we could stain it all over. I'm using the water-based one here uh, simply because I have a little more of it and it's quite easy to apply. When you get up into the where the knot and the grain is, it will still absorb, it just doesn't absorb to quite the same degree. And one thing you'll notice that after it dries, we'll let it dry a little bit. It 
So that's a basic color that's been added to a bowl. You can see that there's it absorbs at different rates, whether it's end grain, side grain, whether there's an obstruction because of a knot. It may not match up perfectly. We can go back over it and maybe make it a little darker. So, we've got a red bowl. But I didn't want a solid red bowl. I've got one. Well, what can I do? Well, I'm simply going to take another color. And start dabbing it. Now, this can be, this is totally sub the individual what they want it to look like. Some people would look at this and say, my that's nice. And the person alongside of them would look at it and say, whoa, that's ugly. But as we know, we all turn different items simply because we like the way they look. So, and if you notice, blue on red basically gives me a very dark purple. We also have some green. Green does not change the red as much. You can see the purple is starting to show up more on the edges. We have taken a plain piece of wood that had differences in colors, grain orientations, different absorption rates, and by being a little creative, and I'm not saying this is a masterpiece by any stretch of the imagination, but it gives you an idea of what you can do more or less depending on how much stain you want to put on, to give you something that's totally different than what your fellow wood turner will do. Now, of course, this could be done on any type of a turned item. It doesn't have to be a bowl. Anything that uh, you have, you could play with. After that would dry, I have a sample here of a board, a little block of oak that I was playing with the other day. It's got some different colors, and you can see that the colors are fairly muted. What I did on one half of it, I sprayed it with lacquer. So once you spray it with lacquer, it brings the colors out to a much stronger hue. And that's what would happen here. Once that has been finished, uh, one thing that I would not do to it would be to put on a water-based polyurethane because if you put water-based product on top of water-based stain, you can imagine what's going to happen. There's a good chance it's going to run together. Now this just happens to be some water and it may not show much, but you can see it comes off. One, it hasn't absorbed into the wood 100%, but water is what activated it to begin with. So, if you start putting a water-based stain on, or water-based finish, 
onto a water-based stained item, you may ruin the look that you had. So go with something that is not water-based. An oil will work. Uh, it could be simply wax. It could be lacquer. You know. But be careful about compatibility. Here is an example of a, of a small piece of bird's eye. Stained one red, or stained it all red, and then I put some blue on it. So of course I get a different color. And this was water-based. This has, half has been covered in wax. This half has been covered, covered, covered sorry, in lacquer. So it's a water-based stain. One's a wax finish. One's a lacquer. It could have been an oil finish. They're very easy to use. Here's an example of, of another piece that's unfinished which is just another piece of maple. Again, a slurry of oil, water-based, alcohol-based. They all absorb at a little different rate and that's basically up to you. How deep you want your color, uh, which product is easier for you to work with. Uh, some people the, al the alcohol may be perfect and other people not. Um, Think about your color wheel, because your color wheel will also tell you by putting, you know, if it was a if it was a yellow product, and for example, I added. Uh, let's go up here to the yellow. If you were yellow and you put red on it, it's going to turn it orange. Yellow and green, or yellow and purple, gives you green. So think of this, you want to be very conscious of what happens to the base color when you add the second color. Here's a couple items that I brought down to show you. This one happens to be one that's airbrushed, which is what we're going to talk about in part two. This one is a combination, the bottom was airbrushed and the top was dyed. So that top, um, actually that top is a piece of maple. This little sample here is simply uh, a pro uh, just a piece of uh, wood that has been airbrushed with some brown and then airbrushed with some black. So the airbrushing is coming up in part two. So this will conclude part one and we'll see you in a couple minutes on part two. Thank you. Welcome back everybody. We're now we're going into part two which is using an airbrush to color wood. An airbrush is a very small item. Air hose, pot of paint, and a compressor. It runs from a compressor. You pull down the trigger. Of course the little compressor starts. But you get some paint. Very, very simple. This is one of the simple designed airbrushes and that it's a siphon feed. You can get others where you have a little pot sits on top and the paint will flow down into the airbrush. Paints, there's a variety of manufacturers of paint. I have a, one from Spectra and one from from Createx, one of their products called Wicked Colors. There is numerous manufacturers of paint. There's acrylic paints, oil-based paints, and lacquers. Acrylics are normally used on porous items like wood, um, if you're doing signs, uh, graphic arts, that type of thing. Most of the people will use acrylics. The oil base can be on a solid surface or on a porous surface. And lacquer is, think of car paint when you think of lacquer. For those who are like to watch hockey, if you ever have a chance to have a good look, close-up look at, a, at the goalie's mask, you'll see some 
pretty fancy designs. Those are done by airbrush. And the guys who do those are real artists. We're wood turners, we get by. So, a heat gun as well. Uh, compressor and the heat gun. The heat gun or hair dryer is simply used to dry the paint between colors if you wish or it does dry very quickly. The compressor I'm using, this happens to be a portable compressor. I was using my home compressor but a portable gives me a little more flexibility. I can take it somewhere uh, if I need and actually years ago I had some damage to a piano repaired and the furniture restorer who came in to do it used an airbrush to tone in the colors on the piano. So it's an item that's been around a long time. When you're brushing, before you start, it's nice to have something to make sure that you've got the right pressure in your air gun, the right uh, nozzle setting, so you can get your colors. The first item I'm going to use is simply a piece of ash that I've sanded to 400 grit. So the airbrush, if I hold it back, you see I get a fairly light coating. If I bring it up a little closer, of course the color intensifies because I'm putting more product on. And if I continue, you'll see that I end up with a fully colored board, which was very reminiscent of the ones that I stained in part one. But now I'm using an acrylic paint instead. So you can get in with the airbrush, you can come in and depending upon your skill and the type of airbrush, you can do small spots. I'm going to make a happy face. Or you can do solid colors. And the noise you hear in the background is my little compressor coming on because they're just a small compressor designed for portable use. So that's one use of an airbrush. What we like to do though is we like to color our wood turnings. And if the cameraman can zoom in right here he'll notice, or you'll be able to notice something. This is a, a regularly turned maple bowl that has gone through the normal grits from 80, 120, 180, 240. It feels very smooth, but of course, on the end grain, on one particular spot, we have a little bit of tear. If I would have used my stain that I did in part one to go over this, the stain would have penetrated into those small pores and it would have looked very similar to the bird's eye maple. You would have seen the little dark dots because it absorbed more stain. That's not, that's not something we want unless it's a piece of bird's eye. So by using the airbrush, and I just got it on slow, I can come in and start putting a color on the bowl. I can turn it, I can have the lathe turning, or I can keep the lathe turned off and put the color on manually. And this is what gives you such extreme variations and techniques. You can do exactly what you want. You can change colors part way through. You can mask off parts that you didn't want to paint. There's the textured area. And you can see it's still showing up because I'm just starting to do a small amount. And I find that depending upon the project, I'll have it turned on, the lathe spinning, or I'll just rotate it. I could do this by hand, but holding it in my hand would be very hard. So you can see I'm getting a very even coating. But look what happens. The spot that had to tear out still shows. So what does that mean? Same as for any finish. Make sure that you have sanded 
and inspected and re inspected, re sanded as many times as you want or as you need to remove the torn grain. If you look at the first section that we did, you can see that because it was a flat board and it was very easy to sand, that the only item that all the differences that you see is just in the grain showing through. There's no tear out because it was a flat board. So, turners remember, any torn grain is going to show up and haunt you at the time when you never wanted anyone to see it. Thank you. We'll move on to part two. Welcome back. We've got another sample on the, on the lathe. This time it's a piece of oak, and it's oak that's not fully seasoned, but I wanted to show you how airbrushing on a porous wood goes compared to the previous samples which were maple, which were very close grain. And this time you'll see it starts to look effectively the same. Does it make much difference in the wood? And I think it will pick up on camera probably how that grain is still showing. Like along here. And as we come around the corner, you will see what happens to a unseasoned piece of wood that gets turned and you leave it in the shop a little too long before you decide to hollow it. It decides to smile at you, and that's not what you wanted it to do. But, procrastination leads to different things happening, and in this case, it's a cracked piece of wood. So again, I'm just going, you can see how the grain in the oak is really pronounced. The color does not disguise it. The same principle as the end grain on the maple. The, the stain, or the paint that I'm putting on is such a light coat that it's providing color to the wood, but it does not have the capability of grain filling. And this is where you can get into some very, very beautiful applications uh, back uh, years ago, especially in England and that, they used to use a product called a liming wax. And it was just basically a wax with a color in it. There, so that's, as you can see, it gives a, it's starting to dry already. If I wanted it to dry faster, I would simply get a heating source. It has to be low, so I've got it down on the low setting. But I can just come back across this at a distance because I do not want to heat up the wood or heat up the finish. All I want to do is help the finish dry because it's a water-based finish, so it will dry off very quickly. And you'll begin to see some differences in the grain, how it is enhancing the grain. So we'll say that's dry enough, and then something else, I don't know if people picked it up when I was doing it, but let me just get, get a little tool here for a moment. Of course it wants to stick more than I expected it would. doesn't want to come off at all. What I have on here is some tape. No, it doesn't want, to, doesn't want to peel off. What I wanted to do was show you that by taking the tape off, maybe I can get it to come from this end. No, failed experiment. The tape is wrapped around. And I guess you could say good tape has good adhesion, and I put it on last night so it doesn't want to come off. 
But what I wanted to show is that there is a way to put a design in your wood, and it's simply to use a, a tape. Uh, I've done it before using auto body masking tape. Very small, very different. Uh, you can get widths. It's very flexible. That's what they do with the, the uh, striping on cars. You can put that around it. it. By the way, it does come off a lot better than the scotch tape that I used. And that will give you a design built into it. Once your product is finished, the one thing that you cannot do, and you'll see what happens here on a surface that, of course, is tape, it's not wood. Once airbrushing paint is finished, you do not rub it. You do not buff it. You do nothing to it except cover it with a clear coat. Think about your car. You take a car to the body shop, they put on a beautiful lacquer finish, you've spent thousands of dollars, they put a nice clear coat over it, they bring it home, you bring it home, or you've done the, all the work yourself and it's home, and there's a little spot on the hood that doesn't look just right. And you say to yourself, Self, I'm just going to take a little sponge, a little abrasive, I'm just going to fix up that little spot in the paint. And what you end up is repainting the whole hood because you cannot fix a small spot. Acrylic airbrushing paint is identical. What you have is what you get. You can change the color by adding different paints, but you cannot repair a spot. Sand, and I've done that before where I've tried to repair early on and I found right away, just sand it off and start from scratch all over again. If that was an oil-based finish, oil-based stain or a water-based stain, I can probably sand it back a little bit and touch it up, not with airbrush. So let me change up to the last project and we'll see another application. Thank you. Welcome back. Airbrush, new color paint, new project. This is a piece of poplar that was turned green. Uh, it's got a little bit of a warp because it was turned green. It's been sanded to 240. It has been coated with a coat of latex sanding sealer, water-based sanding sealer, the Minwax, and it's been sanded back after that to 320 again. So it's nice and smooth. It's nice wood. There's a little bit of grain. Firstly, I'm going to give it a coat of yellow. It's, based, it's a yellow item, but I want to get a coat. Oh, let's run them a little too fast. So we start going, and I'll just stop. And then you can see the color going on. So I want to make sure that I've got a, a nice coating of yellow, particularly at the top. Because this is going to be a two color application. And again, you can hear my little airbrush going because it's a small, portable version. But it's perfect for the type of airbrushing that I'm doing. And you can see the color doesn't show up tremendously because it was a yellow-based wood. Actually, it was a very white piece of poplar. I was surprised. I expected poplar to be more beige or even have a green tint to it. But you can see the color goes on very easily. Gives you good coverage. And you just go slow because you, you want the paint to dry as you put it on. The color that I'm using is a light color but also the paint is being delivered by air. So of course it's a water-based product and being delivered by air it's actually starting to dry as soon as it hits the surface if not before. 
if it was really warm in the in your shop, you may find that your paint may actually start to dry before it even hits your project. And if it does that, you can put in a, a retarder, uh, which is simply a liquid that allows the paint to stay in a liquid form a little bit longer. So there, uh, I've got a, a cover coat over everything. I'm virtually out of paint. So good timing. Now I'm going to put in the second color and I'm going to put it directly into the pot which is the fast way of doing things but what I'm going to do, I'm just going to come over to my board and start painting directly and you'll see the yellow gets taken out replaced by the blue so now I am going to turn this on because I want to get I want to get a nice color going on the bottom That gives you an idea of the effect that you can get. Going from a solid color through to virtually no color at the top. You'll notice it's a little different in some spots and that's effectively because the item is warped if the paint doesn't go on it exactly even. So if I want to put a little more on, all I'm doing is enhancing the colors that I already have put on. And I'm going faster when I get to the top because I don't want a lot of color at the top. And we're done with another project. It's just that easy. Now if you, I'll get all the products and I'll bring them over and you can have a little look to see what we did, a little recap. We started out with a solid red board, ash, then we went to just doing a bowl, and there is our dreaded torn grain. Nothing covers up torn grain. The only thing you can do is remove it ahead of time with sandpaper. Now, this is completely dry. There is a very minor texture to it because it's water-based and it raised the grain. But if I put this back on the lathe and apply a coat of acrylic, clear, clear acrylic, or if I put two or three coats of lacquer, and I would just use rattle can, I wouldn't bother running it through the airbrush, you'll find that that will finish very smooth. It will be completely covered by the clear finishes. And again, don't touch it, don't sand it, don't rub it, just put a coating on. And the same with this one. And if you notice, we started with blue. Yellow. Or sorry, we started with yellow and we put on blue. But we have green. If you go back to the color wheel we looked at originally, if you add yellow and blue, you get green. So remember that when you're putting on your coatings. And that concludes for today. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, you can reach me through my website. At, my email is gordon at woodturninginstruction.com. Have a great day in the shop. Bye-bye.